All right, so I'm going to present a case on hemoptysis and associated vision loss. So this is a 13-year-old African-American girl who has a history of chronic hemoptysis and resulting hypoxia and anemia. And upon admission, she was found to have profound vision loss, and therefore ophthalmology was involved. So her past medical history, she was a very healthy young girl until about July of 2014 when she developed hemoptysis while she was playing basketball. Prior to this, she had never been admitted, never been on any medications. She had repeat admissions over the next 20 months uh, at various institutions in Las Vegas, and she was treated with several high-dose steroid pulses um, followed by oral, oral tapers. And then uh, she also received two doses of cytoxan, and that was in July of this last year, and then that was discontinued. She had a working diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary hemosiderosis. So her ophthalmic history, in about September of 2015, she had a very severe episode of hemoptysis, and her hemoglobin was reported to be a two by her grandmother. However, upon re reviewing her records, it looks like her lowest hemoglobin was about a 5.9. She reports that her vision became very blurry after this and that she had associated right eye pain. And then she was seen by ophthalmology in Las Vegas. We have only some of those records. And her vision was reported to be count fingers at one foot in her right eye and 20, 30 in her left eye. There was no APD and uh, she was referred to retina because she was felt to have some sort of macular irregular, irregularity, though her MAC OCT was normal. And we don't have uh, the records from that, that retina specialist. And then in January of this last year, she was seen again. Her vision had worsened to, to light perception in the right eye and 2050 vision in the left eye. Again, there was not an APD, but she was referred to neuro-ophthalmology in Las Vegas. And again, we don't have those records. So in February of uh, this year, she completed a six-month course of steroids, a very slow taper that started at 80 milligrams twice daily. And then the first week of March, she noticed a decrease in her vision again. She was seen by the, the general ophthalmologist who noted that she had no light perception in her right eye and 20-60 vision in her left eye. It was the first time an APD was noted, and she was sent to get some imaging. But then just about a week or two later, she again develops a very, very severe hemoptysis, hypoxia, and increased oxygen needs, and therefore was transferred from the ICU in Las Vegas to the PICU here at Primary Children's. So her initial examination by ophthalmology uh, the day after admission was no light perception in the right eye, 20-25 vision in the left. She was unable to see any color plates with the right eye, and she had got four out of eight Ishihara plates in the left eye. Her right eye uh, constricted to consensual light. Her left eye was sluggish, but uh, constricted to both direct and consensual light. And there was a very large APD. Her extraocular movements were full, and her, I her IOP was normal. Her orbits, lids, and lashes were uh, normal, and her <coughs> conjunctiva and sclera were white and quiet. Corneas were clear bilaterally. Her anterior chambers were deep and quiet. Her lenses were clear, and her fundoscopic exam showed bilateral pallor of her optic nerves, but her macula vessels and periphery were normal. So her outside workup at this time had included an ESR and a CRP, which were normal, but it was when she was on 80 of prednisone twice daily. Her CMPs have been normal. She's had low hemoglobin for basically 20 months, low MCV, but her iron studies have been normal. Her autoimmune workup thus far, oops, her autoimmune workup this far has been uh, really unremarkable. She did have a lung biopsy done. There was you know, some concern, could this be vasculitis? However, it just showed some bronchiolitis and mild lymphoid hyperplasia. However, again, she was on about two months of high-dose steroids when this was done. She also had uh, MRA head and neck, an MRV of her head, and an MRI brain with and without contrast. This was done in December of last year, so about four months prior to presentation. And in Las Vegas, these were all read as normal. They were overread at Primary Children's and also read to be completely normal. So our differential diagnosis at this time, we thought most likely this sounded like a posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, given that her symptoms were right after she had that severe episode of hemoptysis and very low hemoglobin. However, we also considered optic neuritis. Um, 
considering that there was never an MRI of her orbits done and that it could have been done at a time at which this was quiet. And within that category, we con considered MS, NMO, sarcoid, infectious, and, vas and vasculitis to be most likely. So she had some repeat imaging done. This time it was definitely not normal. You can see that there's some bilateral white matter lesions on both sides and a very large one in the left frontal lobe. And here you can see her right optic nerve is, is um, lit up and she has optic neuritis. And you can see that goes basically all the way from the globe and into the chiasm. She also had lesions in her cervical spine and in her thoracic spine. And then on 3-22-16, her C. Inca came back positive. And as you may know, that is uh, often positive in granulomatosis, polyangitis, previously known as Wegner's. Um, however, usually both, uh, sorry, usually both um, the MPO and PR3 are abnormal, and usually there'll be some signs of vasculitis. A CT angio of neck, brain, and chest was done, all of which were completely normal. So it just didn't seem like this was a GPA. So we brought her over to clinic the next day, and as you can see, she had bilateral optic nerve pallor, um, and strangely, she actually had, had more cupping on the left eye uh, compared to the right, even though it was the right eye uh, that was, had the poor vision. And yet that was kind of, that was confirmed with the RNFL, with the global thinning. There was some um, remaining um, nerve fiber layer inferiorly and nasally in the right eye. And then her visual field in the left eye showed some, uh, a temporal defect, and she could not, uh, she, she was no light perception, so we didn't get one of the right eye. So her me medical course, she did develop transverse myelitis the next day after neuro-ophthalmology clinic, which started with leg pain, and then she developed numbness of her feet and toes, um, and then it ascended, and she, she actually developed paralysis of both her legs. Then she had a lung biopsy done uh, due to her positive C. Anca, and she was off prednisone for a month at that time, so we felt that maybe it would, would show something new. And right after the, uh, the biopsy was done, she was started on high-dose prednisone. So then the next day, we got some big answers, some important answers. Her NMO came back positive, uh, had been drawn twice, and both of them were positive. Um, her high-dose steroids were, were uh, continued, and she started on plasmapheresis. Um, a few days later, her wedge biopsies came back, and they were consistent with vasculitis. And there were no granuloma seen, so that um, kind of did not completely rule out, but felt like the sarcoid was less likely given that there were no granuloma seen. So basically, uh, at this point, we felt that there were two diagnoses, one being neuromyelitis optica and the other being vasculitis. So after she received about um, four uh, treatments of plasmapheresis, her strength started to increase. Uh, she became more stable from a pulmonary standpoint, and she had some subjective improvement of vision out of her right eye. So on her follow-up neuro-opt exam, she, her vision improved from no light perception to hand motion. Her left eye vision did not improve. It was still 20-50. She had a 2.4 log APD in the right eye. Her extracular movements were full. She was still having a little bit of pain with up gaze and her, her intraocular pressures were normal. Her anterior chamber, chamber did show a few pigmented cells, but was otherwise unremarkable, and her fundus exam was unchanged. So her treatment plan is, was basically to get seven treatments of plasmapheresis and then a dose of IVIG. She was started on rituximab and will be on that for a long time, and then she will have a very slow taper of her prednisone. She was discharged to UNLV Hospital over this last weekend, um, and she'll be following up with us in about a month. And if I, I, there were some, potentially some insurance issues and some travel issues, so she may be following up in Las Vegas. So that's that case. Um, I'll have you hold your questions until we kind of uh, go over uh, the spectrum. <laughs>